So the Amanda, what struck me the most when I was reading this this fantastic, uh, you know, sort of wedding map that I on mind maps is the size, you know, the dimension. The spine is slim, it's thin, it, it made me kind of feel a bit user friendly. Okay. Uh, but I'm curious, like why did you choose this size? Yeah, there are uh, plenty of elements of psychology which have gone into it. There's so many uh, that uh, I, I, even I don't think I'll be able to uh, <laughs> off the cuff tell you uh, the, the, the actual number. There is this big science of physical intelligence. And the pioneer in that is a lady called Thalma Lopez. And she's written and researched exhaustively about how the physical world changes our thinking. She calls it embodied cognition. Mm -hmm. our, our bodies literally change our thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. So when you, let's say, feel sandpaper, it, it has a hint of unpleasantness in it. If somebody were to give you a business card and that felt a little like sandpaper, you would probably not see it in a very positive light. Mm -hmm. It's completely irrational, mm -hmm. but that is the impulsive reaction that then you would And it's your somatic sort of sense or embodiment of that experience that yes. gives you that perception. Yes. So that perception is completely irrational because why should the roughness of a person's business card affect your perception of his merit, but he does. So I wanted to just make this as reader friendly as possible. And by, by the way, right now soft copies are not available right now for the, for the public. Uh, it's just available on Kindle. Uh, I, I wanted it to be as attractive as possible and it's working very well. The minute I give this to uh, my clients and uh, copy attendees in Fortune 500 companies, there is a lot of attraction, there is a lot of enthusiasm, which you don't see when people are doing books normally. So lots of stuff, uh, the size, the, uh, the shiny and glossy color, the fonts, uh, there are people who try to pack too much information on the cover of a book, mm -hmm. thinking they got to talk about this one also and that one also, they got to talk about the benefits of the book, they got to talk about and the guys who are famous who have testimonial in this book, they try to put too many things in the cover and too much information is as good as no information. So I try to make information as user friendly as possible in the entire book. Uh, the size, the fonts, uh, very high quality printing, uh, lots of white space. So there are lots of those elements which uh, which have been put in this book and I, I am getting a very Positive. Very good feedback about that. Yeah. I kind of felt uh, that it was extremely, like I use the word user friendly. Right. Because right. Uh, the font did not intimidate and uh, you know, it, it was a read that I literally uh, took maybe two hours with over, right. you know, over in the evening yesterday. Um, right. Felt comfortable, did the exercises on the side. So I felt uh, that worked. I, um, I'm reminded of this book, and you and I were talking about it a little earlier. Mm -hmm. Rob uh, DeBelli, who talks about the art of you know the good life, right. the art right. of living the yeah. good life, and um, particularly reminded about the fact that post thirty, you know, before you're thirty, you want to acquire a lot of knowledge, and from a fellow bookworm uh -huh. uh, to another, you know, we we ended up reading so much. Um, I'm almost inclined to agree with you on the point that you make about being able to have something that you can use because I think we are inundated with so many I mean I open up my email in the in the morning and I've got five different book recommendations. Mm -hmm. And you know, for those of us who love books and I'm talking about that one percent that you're you know who's who's also going to resonate with, with the Mind Map book. Uh, what we want is we want to read it all, but then it becomes overwhelming. That's right. And so I think um, yeah. This mm -hmm. helps us to discern a little bit more. Is that kind of where you were going with as well? To discern, you know, what I want to read, you know, Robert Valley talks about when you find something that is meaningful, mm -hmm. uh, read it, read mm -hmm. it twice. Yeah. To make sure that you're reading it with, and this is another thing that, that we do, is uh, work with presence. Mm -hmm. Be present in what you're doing. It should be that I'm reading it and that I've read it and oftentimes you look back and say, but what did I just read? Yeah. So yeah. is that kind of what you were going for with 
So one of the things about the book is, and it's called the Thin Minor book. It is very deliberately done. It is much easier to write a big book than a thin book. Now you have to think very deeply about each and every word that you write when you're when you're writing a thin book. So it's much tougher. But I think it makes a lot of sense because if you can make something whisper, you should. And I think. the smartest authors in the world i hope some of them are listening to us if they feel compelled to write a big book then they should but they should also write a condensed version and i am sure some of the people listening to our talk will think oh yeah but there are people who make executive books up these for living but they they doing a very good job they helping mankind but i would prefer that the summarized version was done by the author himself i would feel much more comfortable in reading that summarized work or at least yeah. endorsed by the author yeah. not a written but yeah. that's for the next person summarizing yeah. it does it but i want it endorsed by the author otherwise it lacks credibility as far as i'm concerned so reading this with the 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 synopsized version and then going into the book if if you are more interested in the details is what you're saying yes the synopsized version should not be a uh, summary for the sake of summary it should be very meaningful where a uh, people would be able to go out and implement what they learn okay. but the tony books which are too big they are descriptive for no reason at all uh, somebody he wants to talk about learning strategies then he's got to get to those learning strategies quickly he can't waste 20 pages getting to the point and saying oh when was a kid uh, a friend of mine who wore a yellow t-shirt who wore old adidas sneakers came to my room and then he showed me this big book and i opened that book So I'm, I'm, it's too much. I'm wanting to at this point possibly clarify that the books we're talking about in summarized versions are talking about a concept, yes. talking about a principle, yes. and that's the kind of reference, and not so great literary works, which are for their sake of being descriptive. I mean, that's also something that a lot of us enjoy. Yes. So, so you're not saying that all books. So no, uh, no. should be this way. We're talking about concepts, tools, ideas of uh, the next best uh, sort of um, effective tool that you're going to use, whether it is to help you or to understand it or to help your your basic perception of life. Uh, should be quick, crisp, and to the point. Get it done. Get on with it. That's that's what I'm here. Yes. So number one, uh, plenty of people are not going to read the book at all if it's big. So, uh, even if you don't think a condensed book is a great idea, you will agree that something is better than nothing. If he's going to read the condensed book, he's never going to read the big book. He's just going to look at the big book and say, "Forget it. I don't have the time to watch this." Uh, number one. Number two is many people will read the small book and then they might graduate to the big book. Most books have become successful after a movie and book has been made. Excuse me. So, Harry Potter series book sales. The Wonder Woman will be after the movies. Yeah. Uh, the Godfather, yeah. uh, the book series, yeah. after the movie. Yeah. Pumping Iron. Yeah. Like people don't really know it because of the book. Yeah. It made an Arnold Schwarzenegger's life. It was actually a book before it became a movie. I'm sure many people who've seen that movie, crazy fans of Arnold, don't even know that it was actually a book before it became uh, a rocky drama. I so, <laughs> and it's interesting that you bring this up because it is, you know, now that you talk about it, it, it is the 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 go-to mantra today, saying that nowadays. We're shorter with our attention span, and to some extent, yes, I can. You know, I've seen the own my own trajectory in life, and there were moments of summer holidays where all you did was read books, right? Yeah. And now I, you know, in the constant digital stream that's going on, that becomes a bit difficult to to do. So focusing, I think, is one important concept that. We're struggling with today okay. much more than we were doing before. Uh, you know, attention spans also have been drastically kind of uh, you know have taken a, 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 a yeah literate or taken a hit. And uh, most importantly, I think you're saying, and this is something that that I'm really learning in this conversation is this isn't new. This is how we learn. This is how we really react to the world around us. And all you're doing is taking this concept and just making it bigger and better and glossier and you know crisper. Yeah, yeah. Um, and my very recent example is of my daughter. Mm. 
uh, after seeing Mindhunter four times on Netflix. I, I went and bought the book by John Dunnies. And then the, it's very exciting because uh, I, I got so fascinated with the concept of, uh, of studying human psychology by studying criminal psychology. And so, so, so I, I think Mindhunter is great, not just for people who are interested in criminal psychology, but for people who are interested in human psychology humans, yeah. uh, by itself. Yeah. So, so, so that is an example of me buying the book after seeing yeah. the, the the web series, and it's it's so exciting because you see what's fictional and what's not, and you you you're, you're really bring this constantly comparing what's in the book versus what's in the series. So, so, so because of the series, now I'm finding the book much more interesting. Yeah. So, uh, so because of this, maybe people will see videos on my maps and find that more interesting. Yeah. And other stuff. The other. And I, I mean, to, to interject, I mean, I would love this almost as required reading if I were to come into um, a seminar on my maps. I would love to be able to be familiar with the concepts because I've got a million questions. I mean, we don't have enough time to cover them all on this on this conversation. Right. But I have a million questions and I'm the kind of person, I don't know how others are, sometimes, you know, people, everyone's different, but I'm the kind of person is, if I had this and I had read up on this and I was prepared for it, I come in and I take away so much more from a seminar where I'm immersed, where I'm understanding how this can be applied right. in my life. That's what I right. think also is a good, good, uh, good feature. Yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right from a cognitive psychology point of view. Yeah. From a cognitive psychology point of view, if you are attending a seminar, it makes sense to read a book before you do that seminar. But I do not make anything mandatory for my seminars because I just get many people away. So, well, this won't now because well, it's short. <laughs> yeah, but still, because people perceive that they're pressed for time, they, they might think, oh, I, I am supposed to read that, it's required. Uh, and then the alarm bells go off. Yeah, 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 so then, yeah, yeah, so that may put people yeah. off. So, it's not an ideal thing to do to not have it as a part reading, but I, I think it's still helpful because it gets people into the center. Absolutely. And, that, and then they get people who can do it and then they may yeah. uh, probably read uh, Another reason for all these uh, strategies in this book is because I am talking about all these strategies in my mind mapping seminars and I also do seminars in behavior economics under the brand name of Indivisible Selling. But I talk about all these strategies, but I talk about how to get attention, how to enhance your sales, yeah. how to be better at influencing people. Right. So if I don't use those strategies right. myself, yes. so then I, I'm not going to right? Yeah. So I, I've seen people yeah. talk about plenty of things. And then do uh, something completely different. Yeah. I, I've been to a seminar where a guy who's got a stomach four times my size is, is, is doing something on health. <laughs> and, and he's saying, I'm going to give you some mantras, you don't need to exercise. <laughs> That's it, I said, yes, yeah, it seems to work very well on you. I'm really eager to know what those mantras are. <laughs> so, How can I use this? It has to be um, You know, talking about applications, like how could I use my map? Uh, with practical everyday situations. Oh, you can you can use it for just about anything, uh, including uh, say just planning a day, just getting better money and planning a day. Uh, and planning is one of the biggest problem areas of mankind. Uh, research has shown that most people are absolutely terrible at planning. It's called the planning fallacy. And you see all, all around you. You look at government projects which are just announced and there seems to be no planning. You, you think of laws that are made and there's no clarity in those laws. What are, what are we supposed to do? For example, the plastic ban. We had a plastic ban and there was no clarity. If the plastic, if there is a plastic ban, what is it supposed to mean? Does it mean that whatever is made of plastic has to be thrown away? And does it mean that products uh, at, at stores which are wrapped in plastic do those products now have to be yeah. recalled by the companies. So how could a mind map have sort of made this process better? Well, one of the biggest things about planning is people, uh, number one, don't give it enough time and they don't think of enough options. They, they, they plan in an absolutely primitive way. They just, just set out a place and just try to think of various options. Now, that works to some extent, obviously, because you're thinking you're, you're bound to get more ideas, but when you put it on paper and you use the mind mapping, you tend to think of various scenarios. So is then mind mapping brainstorming? Is it, is it brainstorming? It's one of the users. Okay. Mind 
So, that's so what else could I take that? Like when I'm doing something with a mind map. So for example, like I mentioned to you earlier, I was, I was just playing around with it and I decided to plan my week. Yeah. And what ended up happening is I did brainstorm and that gave me that sense of creativity. And if I probably had to say how the my memory part of it work is that I kind of have my priorities, you know, sort of stored in my in my uh, in my brain right now. Mm -hmm. uh, what else could I have done with this mind map that could give me a certain uh, uh, sort of uh, an edge over everybody else, or you know, how could my weekly plan have been uh, added a layer with the mind map? What else could I have done? Okay, so every activity has an element of brainstorming in it. What are you doing? Uh, so there, my maps can definitely help you. I am seeing so many things happening where there is no thought being put into it. Let's say, sending an email to somebody, even a phone call to somebody. I don't think these are light activities. I, I think you have to put your mind and really be clear as to what you're sending and what is the purpose of the email and what is the kind of message you're sending to the other person. Is it information only? Is he supposed to get back to you? Uh, is he supposed to think and get back to you? you that, that kind of thought has to go in into all the important activities. I'm not talking about a light activity. Sure. So, for example, business is a very important platform. Sure. I have had uh, a lady send me an email saying I'm on interview. Uh, and I, I said, okay, and I, I just said, look, in my mind I said, okay, that's not a very nice email because she's going to give me more details. So I asked her for, for some more details and then she responds by saying, oh, I'm still thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh my gosh, why have I wasted my time? And she's not thought it through. Uh, but she was a client of mine, so. So I'm hearing almost that a mind map kind of gives you, um, you know, more clarity. Yes. It also, Sort of could enhance. So coming back to what I what I was um, referring to with the week plan, mm -hmm. I think what you're saying is that it gave me a certain level of quality to the communication. Yes, to understand absolutely. how that could become more refined. To understand how I'm saving a bit of time, maybe in doing things that ordinarily would not have. That's what, something I did notice. Is there were certain things that came out of my map, mm -hmm. uh, which I said, hey, you know, maybe I don't need to focus on it. Maybe this is something that's not a priority. Uh, whereas maybe in the the more linear way, I would just end up writing my to-do list, which then looks huge and overwhelming, and okay. I might not end up doing it. No, actually, actually you think of more things in a mind map than in a, if, if you write a to-do list. But it also kind of gave me that sense of priority. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I saw it working. The, the chances that you will miss out something of importance is much higher in a linear to do list yes. than in a mind map. Yes. Uh, in, in fact, the, the greatest productivity guru in the world, uh, David Allen, who invented the GDD system, getting things done system, yes. has spoken about mind maps. He's put a picture of a mind map that he did himself when he moved from the US to Amsterdam. So he's big fan of mind mapping and he's like the number one productivity guru in the world. It's uh, a huge endorsement and it's great to know that he is using it himself. So, it uh, helps you in many ways and you're not really doing one thing at one time. It's, if you're planning that, it does, then it doesn't mean you're not being brainstorming. Mm -hmm. If you're going to plan for a telephone call, it doesn't mean again you're not being creative. Mm -hmm. you, you are, if, if you are uh, putting more thought into it, then uh, you're going to be much more efficient. So like, what am I going to say at the beginning of the call? What am I going to say at the yeah. end of the call? What am I going to say at the end of the call? Yeah. If all that, yeah. obviously you've got to course correct yes. on the way, but if you have a plan and yes. also you course correct, that is ideal. And plenty of people, they think they're so smart yeah. that they, they feel that, oh, the they, they, they see something that's prepared in a phone call and say, are you yeah. stupid? Yeah. I, I haven't you called a person yeah. before. It's, these are very, very dangerous parts. Awesome. For sure. And I'm almost hearing a sort of, um, you know, a parallel conversation happening in the sense that the whole world is, of coaching has been focusing on mindfulness mm -hmm. for the longest time. Right? Yeah, in, in a totally wrong way. Uh, well, uh, I, I use it a lot. The concept is important. Absolutely. Uh, would mind mapping be a form of being mindful? Yeah, it would. So that's 
because it's giving you a tool, it's giving you a structure, it's, it's saying, okay, do this. Yes. If I tell a person, just tell him, don't do something, right. that, that's either he's going to do it or that's going to be in his mind. If, if I tell a person, don't go on this road, and I'm not showing him any other road, then I, he's still going to go on that road, or he's going to think about going on that road. His mind is still on that road. Right. Whereas, if there are two roads, A and B, and, I, and, I, and he's probably seen both the roads, and I tell him, okay, go on road A, go in this way, and there are lots of rewards going on road A, yeah. then he, it's he's very easy for him to ignore road B and move yeah. on road A. Yeah. So it's very easy for a person to be mindful when he has a tool, yeah. and he really knows what to do, rather than just telling him, okay, Sit in one place and don't think of anything. That's so. That, I think that's I think our versions of mindfulness may be different, but I'm, what I'm hearing in in terms of the application is you have meditation, which a lot of us, when we've advanced a little bit further, would do so sort of without any assistance because you've gone to that stage where you know what you're getting out of it. Sure. Um, and there's a certain amount of creativity that happens through there. And what you're talking about is a guided meditation where there's somebody who's taking you through the structure okay. um, and giving you that sense of direction of an objective that you want to fit out. So that's where I'm hearing this could be a really good way to structure your mindfulness and structure being in the moment and being present for what it is that you want to get out of your day or your business or your personal life or fitness routines and things like that. Yeah, or, or the structure provides the guiding Yes, exactly. 